Sports Business Journal named John one of the top 10 decision makers for Major League Baseball on league, media, and digital issues. He's also known for his reinvention of the spring training business model. In 2011, John established the Orioles Spring Training Facility in Sarasota, Florida, which has resulted in an economic impact of over $500 million since it began. John and the Orioles are a community-focused organization and very generous through their philanthropy. I'll share two examples with you. One is John established the local Baltimore initiative Eat, Train, Live Like the Pros Challenge, a two-month health and fitness initiative taught in public schools by the Orioles to encourage healthy lifestyles and nutritional literacy among middle school students. And secondly, he created Nashville Comes to the Ballpark, artists and athletes playing for their community. Please join me in welcoming John Angelos to our leadership conference. I can't express enough uh, how honored I was when George extended the invitation. Uh, George and Leanna are great friends of my wife Margaret and I, and um, we've come to know them through Nashville, which we came to know Nashville through what they call country music, what Art Demopoulos calls country and western music, and uh, he and I always joke about that. Um, and, and we came to Nashville because my wife Margaret is a songwriter who is signed to a publishing company, and um, it's really made all the difference. It's, it's what brought us to be friends with George and Leanne, and it's what brought me here today. And it's truly my honor to be here. Um, with this esteemed group to be seated next to his eminence and to talk about, I, I think I've already achieved my goal because in addition to his eminence's fondness for the Pittsburgh Steelers, I think I've talked him into becoming a Baltimore Orioles fan. So, <laughs> and if I haven't, I'm gonna work on it for the rest of the weekend. Um, this group is all about stewardship and and pride in, in our shared Greek heritage, and the success of Greek Americans in this country and around the world. Um, and that's really what baseball and sports media means to me and means to our family. Um, I'm here today to talk with you, more to talk to you. So what I've learned in 25 years of uh, being involved with the Orioles and the sports and media field is our business really reflects, in many ways, your businesses. And our culture, our involvement with society reflects how much we need to talk to one another, how much we need to reach across the great distance that often forms between people and reach out and talk with one another. We talk with fans. No one really needs to come to a baseball game. They come to a baseball game because it's fun, it's a distraction, it's something that takes us away from the challenges of everyday life. And as George mentioned, we've, we're approaching at Camden Yards in 25 years almost 70 million visitors and we're the fastest uh, uh, venue in the history of sports the United States to draw our first 50 million fans. I, I'd like to think that that's because we reach out and try to talk to the fans and empathize and ask them what they're thinking, what they like about what we do. And I know all of you do that in your businesses. If I've learned no nothing else, it's, it's that no matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, rich, poor, in the middle, you can reach out to others there always will be some common ground, and I think sports is really the great common ground that we all have. Coming to that sporting venue, whether it's baseball, football, basketball, soccer, it's a place where we can put all those distances between us behind. It's a place where we can have and share a common ground for two hours, three hours, and maybe if we talk a little at the sporting venue, we'll talk a lot more outside of the sporting venue. Um, i also say a word about talking with you. I welcome your questions. I, I welcome them at the end. I, I welcome them throughout the course of what we'll talk about today. Uh, again, dialogue is a great, great thing, and I think one of the things that we all probably agree on is today in the United States there's not enough dialogue. There's not enough 
common ground, there's not enough, there's too much talking at one another. So today we'll talk with one another, I hope. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how I came to be on this stage. Uh, 25 years ago, my family put together an ownership group of local Baltimore and Washington people with, with three goals in mind. Uh, at that time, the Orioles were gonna be sold to a group of out-of-town investors who were very, very good people and are now much later involved in other sports teams in Major League Baseball. But they were from outside of the area and our goal was first to restore local ownership to the team. Local ownership generates stewardship. And owning sports teams, again, like the mission of this group, it's not about who owns the team. One day we will no longer own the team. Someone else will. Before us, someone else did. It's not about who owns it, it's what you do with it while you have it. It's about how good of a steward you are and how creative you are in trying to use the platform for some sort of social or charitable purpose. So the first goal of that group, and that group I should mention was not just made up of our family, was made up of a number of well-known people and, le and lesser known but equally successful business people. Uh, our partners included at the beginning Tom Clancy, the well-known author, Barry Levinson, the director, Jim McKay, who's famous uh, for the thrill of uh, victory and the agony of defeat and his work at Wide World of Sports and Jim was a, <clears throat> a tremendous person. Um, Pam Shriver, the, the world-class tennis player, was one of our partners. What all those people and others had in common was they wanted to bring back local ownership and they wanted to take this sports vehicle and do a lot of good in the community. Um, Long before we did that, and I was fortunate enough to be in my 20s and 30s and 40s and to be involved in this sort of had this ringside seat at this and then to become increasingly involved in it. And about 12, 12 or so years ago, we, we diversified into the media business from the sports team business. Long before we did that, uh, my mother's father was a tavern owner in Baltimore. My father's father owned a tavern in Greektown in Baltimore. And my uh, mother's grandfather had a food truck and sold hot dogs outside of Memorial Stadium at Orioles games. So from my great grandfather to my standing here on this stage, uh, as my uncle likes to say, um, we went from outside the ballpark to inside the front office. So. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and that, that story uh, is one that has been replicated so many times over and over in Greek American life to the credit of all of our ancestors and I'm here today because of that history, because of my family's uh, ac actions before me. Um, in the last 25 years, sports and sports media has changed dramatically. Um, people like to you know, talk about how uh, the players on the field and what goes on between the lines. In fact, last night, I was supposed to be here last night, but I, we, we just completed two and a half days of our quarterly league uh, owners and executives meetings, and I was in Los Angeles, and I called Margaret last night, and I said, I'm not gonna make it which is never a call that you want to make to Margaret. Um, but, I, but I pulled it out of the fire. I said, I'm going to go to dinner with Liam, who's our son. And I sat down with Liam, and he had his girlfriend with him. And he, uh, we had dinner at a ramen place near the airport in Los Angeles. And Liam said, well, what was interesting that you talked about at the owners' meetings? And I thought to myself, you know, first I thought, what did we talk about at the owners' meetings? I couldn't, couldn't think, of it, think fast enough. And then I thought, what's going to be interesting to a 20-year-old boy who's a crazed, or, uh, crazed uh, baseball fan? And I was running through all these completely esoteric and thoroughly boring topics. And I landed on one and I said, well, we talked about pace of play. We're going to speed up the pace of the game. And we've all, we all know about millennials, and millennials have a short attention span, and everyone's staring at their phone, and I think they're, they're eight-year-olds and 80-year-olds that are, have that problem. But, but um, I thought this will make sense to Liam. 
we're going to speed up the pace of play. And Liam thought about it for a second, and he said, yeah, my friends and I don't think that's a very good idea. <laughs> so in fact, we think it's a terrible idea. And I thought, I just spent two and a half days with people 50, 60, 70s, and, and 80 years old with hundreds or thousands of years of business experience. Maybe they should get rid of some of us and get some of these 20-year-olds in here because they seem to have a better grip on what millennials want or what our fans want than maybe we do. And I think that's an important lesson in our business lives and in all of our lives that, that sometimes we get in these small circles and we go into these rooms and close doors and we're going to figure the world out. And maybe it's more about who's outside the door and who we need to bring in and get fresh perspectives. So um, that was my first attempt at a Q&A. And uh, Liam hit me with a question I couldn't answer. I hope some of you will ask me easier questions today at the end. Um, we, um, we have attempted over the last 25 years to make sports very accessible, to make Camden Yards an entertaining place, to, to make sports media something that we can develop in a, in a positive way. When we were talking at the table earlier about the high cost of sports tickets, someone said the front row at Yankee Stadium is on the order of $1,300 for one seat for one game. That's pretty staggering. And it's New York, so they can afford it. When we started at Camden Yards in 1994, the front row behind the Orioles dugout was $13. And I actually asked a sports executive, a friend of mine who's from Baltimore yesterday, I asked him what the number was and he said $75, which is wildly wrong because you just can't contemplate how, how the world has changed in sports and sports media. Um, when we started in sports and sports media, the number of Orioles games that were on television was about 30 or 40 out of 160. Today, it's every game of every pro team, baseball, football, basketball. There are probably 50 sports channels on and all of your cable and satellite and, and, and other just distribution platforms at any one time. When we started, there was this thing called scalping tickets, and we used to chase people around outside the ballpark. People would actually get arrested for scalping tickets. Today, all the teams in the league essentially scalp our own tickets. Live Nation scalps concert tickets, but we don't call it scalping anymore. We call it the secondary ticketing market. <laughs> so much like, as Orwell uh, predicted, uh, language is often everything. And it can be liberating or it can be damning. So we have the secondary ticketing market today. Um, the, um, when we started in baseball and in sports, there were draconian prohibitions on sports gambling. And they called it that, sports gambling. You couldn't take any advertising from anything that was a casino, let alone a bookmaker. Today, we don't call it sports gambling anymore, and the prohibitions have mostly been lifted. We call it gaming. So the world is changing yet again. Um, as sports and sports media has changed, We've tried to change with it. I think the greatest, the greatest uh, warning that every new sports ownership group gets, and there's a sort of a custom in Major League Baseball, when they vote on the n new owner, the prospective owner, and whether they're going to be approved, whoever that person is, man or woman, who's leading that group stands outside the room, and they take a vote. And if it's a positive vote, the commissioner will say, well, OK, they've been approved. Let's bring them in. And let's give them a big round of applause because this is certainly going to be the last one they're ever going to get. <laughs> and that's true because when, when owners come in, there's incredible pressure to win. And we talked about the Pittsburgh Pirates earlier and the, the pressure to keep your players and buy that next player and buy that next free agent. There's a tremendous pressure to listen to talk radio. That was 25 years ago. We call that social media today and to listen to what every fan says and to focus on winning at all costs and to focus on the game between the lines. And I think what I hope I've learned and that we've all learned is it's less about what goes on between the lines. Certainly you want to win. The Orioles hadn't been in the playoffs for 13 years. And when we went to the ALCS in 96, we went again in 97, and we were the smartest people in the room. 
then we lost for about 12 years and we were the dumbest people that ever came across a baseball field. The last five years we've been relatively successful and we're, I wouldn't say we're viewed as smart, but we're viewed as tolerable because we've been successful. The pressure is always to look between the lines, but the opportunity is far beyond the field. Sports owners have great platforms and great access points to the public. All of you have that as well in your businesses. Our business really isn't that big. It's not that great in terms of revenue. It's not that great in terms of many impacts. It's great in terms of the interest and the media and the scrutiny and the attention we get. And we hope that we can take that and turn that towards good purposes, partner with those that are doing good things in the community, much in the way that everybody here is doing great things in the community with your platforms and with your access points. We, we've tried to do that by reaching out and applying our brands and applying our platforms to good causes. Um, we've focused on children and education and literacy and arts and culture and many other things. And all these sports owners across the country do that, as all of you do it in, in your work. Um, we have found that uh, doing that takes some of the focus off of what they say in social media, what they say on talk radio, and it really deploys the brand. It really energizes what we do. Um, we have learned, I think, through that example, uh, the example that we found of, as we've moved the brand from a team only to a media property, that we're really not in the sports business, that we're really in the entertainment business, we're in the people business. There's an old apocryphal story where the new NFL owner looks out and says, what's the profit and loss statement on the cheerleaders? That's, that's a pretty good sign you don't know what business you're in yet, but you're gonna learn eventually. It, you know, if you think you're in the hockey business, you've probably missed the bigger picture. If you think you're in the baseball business, you may have missed the bigger picture. If you're worried about cutting the cheerleaders because um, you don't think they're generating a certain dollar amount, you probably missed the, the larger purpose. We were talking earlier about soccer. The growth of soccer in the United States has been tremendous, and I think a big reason for that is because it's so family-oriented, it's, and it's safe. And it's, an ability, it's something that girls and boys can equally play. And kids can, uh, parents can bring their children to it. And that's really what it's about. That's what sports is about. It's, a, it's not about winning at all costs. It's not about holding up trophies. It's not about um, any of that. It's about a good use of kids' time in a place that's better than, say, running the streets. Better than, say, doing a lot of things that we wouldn't want our kids to do. So. One of the unfortunate things, and I'm sure many of you have young children, and, and, and those of you who are younger and will have young children, I, I tell parents when they ask me, sometimes I'll tell them when they don't ask me, the, what's, what's gone on in, uh, in youth sports in this country, and youth sports is a great, great asset of this country, of all people around the world. Uh, What's gone on in the transformation of youth sports in this country is something we should all really look at because there are some concerning aspects to that. Youth sports, in my humble view, should not be about preparing little, little children to become profes professional athletes. And it should not be about preparing little children to seek college scholarships. Now, there's an incredible economic reality, there's a pressure on people to seek college scholarships because of the astronomical escalation in the cost of college education, which is really a terrible thing. Education should be accessible to everyone, and certainly you need no look, look no further than our ancient ancestors to know that that was the emphasis of Greek culture, and that should be the emphasis in, in this country. And it's because education is so inaccessible that youth, youth sports, for, in many ways, have been converted to this seeking of scholarships and professional, uh, professional uh, play. It's virtually infinitesimal the chance that your young child, no matter how good of a baseball player or football player they are at 14, is going to be a professional athlete. So the thing to do with youth sports is take advantage of the good in it. 
the good in it is the play, and the good in it is to get into get your child into a better school than they might not have than they might have gotten into. You know, Brown University plays baseball too. Everybody isn't going to be Roger Clemens at University of Texas or uh, a professional baseball player, and that's okay. The problem today is that youth sports has been converted to a money-making machine, has been converted into a track towards professional athleticism that is really a fantasy. And I would encourage you all, don't be bull rushed into youth travel teams or don't have your children made into mini professional athletes before their time. It's important to let the kids enjoy their lives, play the games, and then one day, if that college program comes a calling, and if they really belong at Wichita State playing Division I baseball, by all means, that's a family decision. But if they'd be better off at Swarthmore pay, playing Division Three baseball and getting a great education, they should do that. And they really should do what they want to do. And they shouldn't be compelled by their parents or by any coach anywhere to single sport. Our manager, Buck Showalter, made a great statement a couple years ago that didn't get enough press. He said, I don't believe in single sporting. I don't want kids to play only baseball. I want them to play lots of sports, develop their bodies, develop their minds, have their freedom of choice. And if they want to be a pro baseball player for the Orioles later, I welcome them in. So that, that's an emphasis that I have, and I would be remiss to not share it with you. I, I'm often disappointed or concerned when I go to a Little League baseball game and I see the emphasis on winning and the emphasis on um, advancing. Uh, there's, a there's a scene in, in the famous movie Moneyball where Brad Pitt playing Billy Bean, who's still the general manager of the A's, says to the, the sort of the character, the prototypical scout, you know, we go into these living rooms and we try to talk these kids out of not going to USC or not taking these college scholarships and coming to play with us. And we honestly don't know which ones are going to make it. Well, in that scene, the Billy Bean character, Brad Pitt, the actor, is talking about 18 to 22-year-old players, 18, 19-year-old players. If we don't know what they're going to be, at 18 or 19, and we're the professionals, we start, nobody knows what they're going to be at 12 or 14. So let's let them have fun. Forget about the pros. Some of them will be pros and 99.9% .9 won't. But they'll be pros at something else. So I would have never set, told that story or gone on like that 20 years ago. I would have been fascinated with not use, losing ticket sales to rainouts and what somebody called up and said on talk radio. But today what I'm fascinated with is how a sports team can partner with a symphony orchestra, how a sports team can partner with the good works of the church, how the sports, a sports team can partner with musicians who can't get health insurance because they're self-employed. There's been a lot of uh, controversy and a lot of hue and cry recently around the NFL and certain players kneeling down during the national anthem. And I, I'm sure we could get 50 different opinions on that. Or if there are 350 people here, we'll get 350 different opinions on that. I, I, I think the importance of that example is that whether you agree with those people or strongly disagree with them, that there have been earlier examples in this country of other athletes at other times who've stood up for various causes against really overwhelming odds. And they've and and, and they not not by kneeling down during the national anthem, by doing other things. Well, Muhammad Ali famously refused to be drafted. Whether one agreed with that or not, it's important to think about what it must have been like in the 1960s to be an African-American athlete who just become heavyweight champion of the world, knowing that not too many people were probably happy about that because you weren't white. And they didn't even call you African-American then. They called you lots of other things. And to put all that at risk and go from heavyweight champ to have your belt taken away, 
to being threatened with put in, being put in prison for decades. So whether you agreed with Muhammad Ali or not, you have to really reflect upon the strength of the resolution of conviction and character that he must have had. I think about people like Billie Jean King, Martina Navratilova, who pushed for women's recognition in tennis and diversity, recognition of people that had different, different points of view and different orientations and how difficult that must have been. I think sports has taught a lot of lessons to society because it reflects society. It's a place, again, we can all talk. It's a place that sometimes some of the speech is too controversial to have productive dialogue. And I think some of the criticism of the anthem protest revolved around that, that there was the wrong time and the wrong place. But I will tell you this. I don't have an opinion one way or the other on whether that was right or wrong. But I will tell you that those people that did that will have inevitably and irreparably harmed their their marketability. Their agents, many of whom I know, did not call them up the next day and say, I've got new sponsors for you. In fact, they probably called them up the next day and said, you don't have any more sponsorships. And whether you would say, that's good, they shouldn't have sponsors, or that's terrible, that they would be retaliated against. I think it's important when you think about those who have had conviction. Maybe there's something worth hearing. Maybe it's worth hearing those people out. Why did they do it? Probably, maybe you'd say, I'm never going to agree with them. But it might be worth hearing what they have to say. We had, we had players on our team that no one kneeled down on our team. In baseball, that didn't take any uh, life. But we did have players on our team that were outspoken about different issues. And two and a half years ago, we had some civil disturbances in Baltimore around people that were around the, 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 the killing of an individual while in custody in Baltimore City Police Department custody, which led to a lot of unfortunate civil strife and spilled over into Camden Yards. We played the first game in the history of Major League Baseball with no fans because the police and the authorities were concerned that they couldn't, they couldn't both monitor the ballpark and also monitor other parts of the city. I don't know what the significance of that is. Perhaps the only significance is there are pressures on the society today in this country, and they've probably been building for a long time. And even though we all sit here today, and even though we will probably never spend one day in neighborhoods like West, those neighborhoods in West Baltimore, and not apologizing or excusing violence, but I can tell you from living in Baltimore that those neighborhoods, which I've never lived in, have always been that way. They've been that way my whole life. They've been neglected my whole life. And while we have pumped more and more money, and I'll say first and foremost, into sports venues, Camden Yards, Raven Stadium, great places. Harbor Place, real estate development. But while we have made those the priorities, these other parts of our city, in Baltimore anyway, I don't know about your cities, have been neglected. And I'm really concerned about that. Because if you ask me whether we should continue to take public money for sports, and our, co our, our partners at the other 29 teams, if, uh, please don't tell them I said this because they'll be very angry with me. <laughs> If, if the cost of continuing to subsidize sports venues and real estate development is the degradation of neighborhoods and such imbalance and inequity in society, just one man's opinion, and I know other people will not agree, I think that price is too high. It's too high. So does that mean we don't do those things? No, we do. We keep doing public-private partnerships, but we make sure they return on investment. We make sure the ROI is really there. We did a, we did a deal in Sarasota, Florida, where the state of Florida put uh, $8 million into our, into our academy, into our stadium. The county that we're in, Sarasota County, beautiful area, put 24 million into the, into the stadium. And we put 10 
we put the smallest piece with the second smallest piece. And we promised the county and the state of Florida that by the Orioles being there, we would generate $40 million in economic impact. And I'm happy to tell you, uh, George mentioned it, some of the numbers, that last year we generated $91 million in economic impact in a year. And if every public-private partnership that we all do works out that way, then I think we won't have these inequities. I think we will have balanced out all the needs in the society. We will have dipped into the public trust, but we will have replenished that public trust many times over. I think that'll make for fewer Baltimores and Detroits and Clevelands and some of the strife that we've had. And I would be willing to give up the subsidies for Camden Yards to get there. But that's just one man's opinion, and many people disagree with that. But I think it's worth a dialogue. It's worth discussing budget priorities federally and locally. So that maybe the kids at the Little League field don't have to chase single sporting and youth sports to get a college scholarship because maybe that education shouldn't be free, but it should be more subsidized. It should be more invested in. Because $65,000 a year to go to a college is awfully steep. Probably even, that's a lot of money for people in this room, but it's, maybe, but, but it's certainly a lot of money for everybody else. So I, I'm concerned about that, and I think we're really focused on it from an educational standpoint and a public-private partnership standpoint. And we're hopeful that that's a way sports, sports teams and sports owners can lead and say, yeah, I want to partner with the public trust, but I want to pay my share and I want to generate ROI that really makes a difference. Again, I wouldn't have said that 20 years ago. I wouldn't have known to say that 20 years ago. So it's been quite a journey for us, and the journey continues. We hope we'll continue to be involved for the next 25 years, or we hope that if someone else is the steward of a sports team in Baltimore, they will be local owners, they will be invested in the community, and they will do for our hometown what you all are doing here today.